for any problems that might show up so we can fix them quicker. But uh, lots of things, as you probably could guess, go wrong that we didn't plan for. And just kind of have to be prepared for anything. Now, Mike, you your role is kind of fixing stuff. You're a marine technician. So you go back and forth between the scientists and the ship's crew to make sure all of the equipment is working correctly so that we can get the data for Jonathan, correct? That is correct, yeah. So on board, we've got cranes. You fix those? Well, the, the, probably more of the engineers. The okay. Stuff, but uh, yeah, we did a lot of work with the winches. And yep. Stuff. You've got a magnetometer dragging off the back of the boat. What is that? Uh, it's basically measuring the magnetic field of the Earth as we drive along. Cool. And it basically looks like a big torpedo. It's, yeah, it's like a wily. Coyote torpedo. Wiley Coyote torpedo. That's awesome. Um, now, when I first got on board the ship, you also were rebuilding something else that was on the workbench. What was that? Uh, which time? Which, which time? How many of you guys, uh, anybody in the classroom played with drones at all? As a, how about you guys in at, on the vineyard? Any of you kids played with uh, drones? Yeah. Yeah, drones. Or robots? Yeah. Yeah. So Mike here, he was telling me about it, and I'll let him tell a little more, but you actually built an ROV. You built a whole underwater robot. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, we built one. Some guy's garage in Seattle. I <laughs> uh, have a little pet project to his for his work that he does. Um, he's a professional diver, uh, recovers their like fishing gear. So we built basically an underwater robot to go down deeper than people can dive on and uh, uh, collect gear and clean up. Could you build me a small robot that would go down and get all the lures that I lost last fall during the fishing derby? It'll cost you quite a bit. Okay. Yes. Anybody else lose some lures in the derby? Yeah. Um, now, so you fix drones, you build ROVs. What did you go to college for? What was what was your your deal in college? I uh, did uh, electrical engineering and computer science college. Electrical engineering and computer science. So how did you get into building stuff? Were you just always doing that? Yeah, kind of. And it's just a lot of on-the-job experience, too, was, uh, just kind of as I went. All right, cool. And what's the coolest place it, that you've been as a marine technician? Uh, I worked in Antarctica for seven years. Antarctica for seven years. Yeah. Yes. I'm still insane, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you've also been to the Arctic as well as the Antarctic. Yeah. yeah. A lot of work there too. So have you been to the South Pole and the North Pole? Not quite the poles because, well, there's land in Antarctica. Right. So there and too much ice up north. But yeah, it's about 70 degrees latitude on the coast. Crazy, yeah. crazy. Um, what do you like better, Arctic or Antarctic? Antarctic. Really? Why? Uh, it's much more beautiful. Really? All the big mountains and wildlife everywhere. Yeah. Very cool. Very beautiful. So we're looking at how many screens do we have here, boys? We've got something like 13 screens in, in front of us. 14. 14. You count faster than me. What are we looking at? Um, you guys have uh, been helping me out, getting me to understand all the science that's happening. Uh, what do we have going on here? Well, uh, let's see. What can they see? All right. Yeah, all right. So right here we have our multi-beam uh, display. This is the real-time image of the live data that the sonars are collecting from the ocean floor. So basically, as we sound, send sound down to the ocean floor and it bounces off, comes back to us, we see how deep it is and we're basically making a map. So as you can tell, we uh, this is where our ship is, this is where we've already mapped, and this is the live data coming in in real time. So we're uh, currently sending sound to a uh, depth of 3,400 meters. Uh, the, the screen below that is where we're actually cleaning up all of the sonar data and the multi-beam data and making a, a full nice mosaic map. So we've already mapped one seamount right here. That was two days ago. We mapped these two seamounts last uh, yesterday. 
and we're currently working on one seamount down here. So, Jonathan, is the red the top of the mountain uh, and the blue the bottom? Yeah, so basically the color scales here goes from the deepest at the blues and purples all the way to the shallowest at the reds and yellows. And so this uh, summit is about 1,000 meters beneath the ocean. The ocean floor at the blue, that's about 5,000 meters. So we're talking the bottom, the deepest part is about three and a half miles deep, and the top of the mountain is under a mile underneath the ocean. Just under a mile, yep. So that's that's shallow in your guys' world, right? A mile below? A <laughs> mile below is pretty shallow, yeah. yeah. Um, that's crazy. Uh, now, what is this makeup? of the these mountains what sort of rocks are in these mountains so these are all volcanoes at one point uh they were actually above the ocean so you might have seen that the uh the tops of them were all colored red they didn't have a, a central peak so these were volcanoes above the uh actual ocean and how many millions of years ago was about this? 90 million years ago is when these uh volcanoes were erupting and so all of these mountains on the seafloor, all different volcanoes uh, erupted. They're in a place called the, the Johnston Atoll area and Johnston Atoll Seamount Group. It's actually a, a, an area made up of tens of different volcanoes and very, very volcanically active period during the, the Earth's history. And why is it important? These, these seamounts are in the middle of nowhere. They are literally, we are a thousand miles southwest of Honolulu. Why is it important that we map these? Why do we need this? Uh, we're actually making maps because other groups are interested in coming back here with their underwater robots or the ROVs that you heard Mike talking about that he builds. Uh, there's a couple of different groups that come back out here with their ROVs and they're going to actually dive down to at least 4,000, 3,000 meters beneath the ocean. And uh, surprisingly, there's an abundance of marine life down there and that's what their goal is. So. We provide them with a detailed map so they know exactly where they're going. They can descend the ROV down safely. And as well as uh, the, uh, the shape, the little textures that we can make out from the high resolution images, the multi-beam data, allow us to build a geological picture and kind of uh, tell the story of time, so to speak, I guess. <laughs> um, now we've got about five minutes left. So uh, do you, either of you two have any questions for the students? No? No questions? All right, guys. Then it's, what do you have for these guys? I mean, yeah, I have another question. It's, it's for Mr. Um, that guy from America. All right. Yeah. I have just just go one. ahead and speak out the question. Go for it. Okay. Uh, how do you get internet on the boat? <laughs> How do we get internet on the boat? Great like question. The ocean. So we use satellites. We have massive, massive antennas on two of them on top of the ship. Signals uh, up to satellites and then back to you guys. So right now we're in the science control room. We've got Wi-Fi in the ship. We use the Wi-Fi, it connects to the satellite receivers, SIG goes up to the satellite, and then VRHS. Next question. Gotta talk louder. Ooh, that's a tough one. How much schooling did it take for all you, for you guys to do this? We were just talking about that in here. Jonathan, how, you're, you're still in college? No, I've been in college for 10 years. So you, but you have a master's. I have a master's degree. You're a little bit at the other end of the spectrum, aren't you? Uh, I just did a four year. Uh, uh, yep. And the rest of it's just been on the job. On the job training. training like as you said, you went to learn computer sciences, and then um, and then you've kind of fell into this. Cool. All right. So, and I went to college uh, as well, and I went to MVRHS. So. What's the difference between multi-beam and sonar? 
What's the difference between multi-beam and sonar? Well, uh, sonar is a... Cool. The more beams, the more we cover, the better picture we get. There we go. Is there any way for students to get on board? Yes, there are ways for students to get on board. In fact, we have two students on board right now. Uh, we have Juliana. She's an intern. She's at Maine Maritime. And then we also have Andrew Kang. He's from Guam and actually uh, has been going to the University of Texas. And right on Schmidt Ocean website, there is applications for student opportunities. Um, I don't believe you can do it in high school yet, but as soon as you're 18 and in college, then there are opportunities to come on this vessel. Next question. Um, I got another one. Okay, so yep. what's the triangle that has the great tip on it on the third screen to the yeah, that one? Yep. The, what's the color? So the triangle right here, correct me if I'm wrong, this is actually the multi beam as it goes through the water column. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. So this is actually showing us how wide of a picture we're getting right now. Right now, how, how, how many meters wide are we getting? 6,900 6, meters wide is the swath that we're taking a picture of. And then what's the ink line it goes through? That's the ocean floor. So that's the ocean floor. Then, wait, we can see below the ocean floor? You're just telling me this? We can see into the earth? We can't with this sonar. Um, this is a false color image. We're basically, what, what this is showing us is the water column. And one cool thing is uh, the sound actually interferes with more than just the ocean floor. So if you see this little light colored blue right here, these are uh, layers of different animals and uh, plankton actually right now. So it's still dark outside right now. And all the, the plankton have come up closer to the surface of the ocean. And uh, this is what we're looking at. And this little ring that just appeared, this green bit right here, that's actually interference from um, something else we don't really know. We've been seeing it pop in and out, but... Potentially a whale feeding on that plankton? Potentially a whale feeding on the plankton, yep. So actually, sperm whales have the same frequency of calls that we're using to map the ocean floor. So if a sperm whale is calling out to its sperm whale friends, uh, we can actually see them talking on the sonar. That's pretty cool. All right, I've got time for one more question, guys. What else do you have for me? How did you get the Megalodon tooth? <laughs> How did what? How did you actually get the Megalodon tooth from the bottom? One of the earlier episodes. So. So the megalodon tooth that was gotten from the bottom on a previous uh, trip, that was with an army, is that correct? Uh, it was with something called a, uh, a dredge. Uh, they basically throw a bucket over the side of the ship or the back of the ship, and they drag it along the ocean floor, collecting samples of whatever is on the ocean floor, and just so happened to pick up a megalodon tooth. Like a orange Home Depot bucket, just to run the. Uh, these are something like you can imagine a uh, two by six by two crate or something like that. This really big metal crate. Uh, hook it up to the back of the ship, drag it along the ocean floor, and it rips up whatever it rips up, and you bring it to the top. And usually, it's full of mud and rocks. And in this case, there was a megalodon tooth that was the size of a hand. That's pretty wild. And how old is that megalodon tooth? Oh, over a hundred million years is that correct let's go for greater than 65 That's okay I guess. 65 million by the way all right 65 years. last question monica go for it why do you care the kind of minerals are at the bottom of the ocean uh well so what's really kind of driving the industry for minerals on the ocean floor these things called manganese nodules or manganese crust. Uh, another name for them is polymetallic crust. Uh, the name actually describes exactly why we care about them. It's all the metals that are in them. And these minerals contain lots of heavy min uh, metals, lots of trace elements. So what do we use those for? Any of you guys really like your uh, smartphones and your, your computers, that's what they're made up of. So. Um, there, uh, there, there's a lot of interest in mining those minerals off the seafloor. 
Uh, aside from that, the other minerals for geeks like me who care about rocks can tell a lot of different stories of where these volcanoes came from. Uh, basically, you can tell an entire story of the Earth's interior just with one mineral. So these volcanic rocks, they hold minerals and the minerals hold information and uh, scientists like me use those minerals to extract a whole bunch of different kinds of stories from uh, how the earth formed, how hot is it, how fast is it cooled, how big were the eruptions, and why did they erupt. Um, and then the, from the biologist, the marine biologist side, there's a lot of life on these nodules, is that correct? There are a lot of life, especially on the, uh, the rift zone ridges or these underwater ridges that the volcanoes have formed. And sponges love to sit on top of them because it helps them feed better. So they're filter feeders. And when they live on the ridges, they're actually getting fed a lot more food in those particular areas. So they love to live down at these depths where they can get uh, nice currents sweeping up over the ridges and lots of yummy food for them to eat. And it's kind of amazing uh, the amount of and the density that of animals that's down there. You'd kind of think that the deep sea is barren of life when in all actuality you could probably uh, well I've seen some rift zones where we couldn't even sit the ROV down on the ground there are so many things on the ground so awesome awesome well guys I appreciate you taking the time out from mapping uh, MVRHS uh, thanks for joining us on board Falcor I would really encourage you guys to check out the website schmidtocean.org you can also find uh, a lot of info on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, through Schmidt Ocean, 11th Hour Racing, or my own page. We're posting some cool stuff. And um, if you have any questions, that's a great way to ask them. And we're happy to get back to you uh, as soon as we see it on our phones. Uh, so thanks again. And I uh, look forward to speaking to you guys soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.